Welcome everybody to Vea Hafta's presentation, Homelessness in a Whole New Light. My name is Ruth Hart, and I am the Community Services Coordinator at Vea Hafta. Thank you for joining us on World Homeless Day, which is observed in 100 countries. It's an annual opportunity to reflect on this massive global social problem, to raise awareness and empathy for people who are experiencing homelessness right now. I will be delivering this presentation and many of our marvelous frontline staff are online. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please just drop them into the chat. And at the end, we're gonna go into a question and answer segment and our staff will answer your questions. One way to understand the depth of the, the problem is through the numbers. There are 35,000 people facing homelessness in Canada. The conversation about homelessness really begins with a discussion about poverty. What is poverty? In a nutshell, it's the cost of your basic needs that exceeds your financial resources. Another way to look at it is what you earn doesn't keep pace with your expenses. So just to put poverty into perspective, here is how many people are receiving assistance from the government when they're on social assistance. The total annual welfare income starts at $10,473 for a single adult. So we can all relate to this idea of balancing the budget and cost cutting. So for one family, it might mean not sending your kids to camp one summer. For another person, it's that vacation that you planned for, for, for several years, you might decide to put it on hold or to decide to hold off for a year or two. But in poverty, the cuts that are made are really, we're talking about basic necessities, not luxuries. So imagine needing to decide between paying your rent or food. And we know that food costs have skyrocketed. The food bank visits are now at 279,000 a year. So food bank visits can definitely help supplement your grocery expenses. Being impoverished really does take a toll on both your physical and your mental health. One can only imagine the stress that's involved in not being able to feed your kids or pay your rent. One in five Canadians are experiencing mental health. And so by age 40, that number is one in two. So imagine the kind of mental and emotional experiences a person goes through on a daily basis. Stress, anxiety, food insecurity, a sense of hopelessness, depression. And what about your physical ailments that arise from that? And so that all has an impact on the family. If you're only focused on survival, you're really not thriving. You're not thinking about plans for the future. You cannot develop yourself as an individual. You're constantly in emergency mode. So you don't have time to think about what comes next. And then there's intergenerational poverty. Poverty passes from generation to generation in this way. It's very hard to break out of the emergency mode with very few opportunities to escape the cycle. It's unrelenting and there's no access to opportunities. And then there's the social and cultural expectations that takes over your life. This becomes your reality, it's your norm. According to a study at the University of California, Davis, one third to one half of children who are poor for a substantial part of their childhood will be poor as adults. And then there's the high cost to society. Ultimately, poverty is very costly to society, both because of the intergenerational nature of it, the difficulty in breaking the cycle, 
and because of the ongoing reliance on social assistance, which is really only a Band-Aid solution. And then there are increased emergency room visits and increase in crime in communities, subsidized housing costs. The end is not in sight. Homelessness is the bottom rung of the poverty continuum. So when poverty reaches a tipping point, it means that you can no longer afford your shelter. Remember that juggling between rent and food? That is the tipping point. So in a lot of cases, people are invisible. You may not even know that they're experiencing homelessness because they're couch surfing or they are staying in temporary shelters like motels people living out of their cars and going to their jobs. You may not know. As you can see from this graph, the number of rough sleepers in our city has increased wildly over the last few years. So the number that I threw out at the beginning of 10,500 and 10% 10 of that number of people in Toronto living experiencing homelessness are sleeping outside. We call them rough sleepers. There's been a 98% increase in rough sleepers since 2021. So what about the shelters? The shelter system in Toronto has beds that total 9,572 and they are at capacity. There are wait lists everywhere. So imagine, even if there was room, what would be the reasons for a person to decide to make a go of it on their own and to stay outside? Some of the reasons are really valid. There is overcrowding. Conditions are not clean. There are bug infestations. Tight quarters, rules and regulations about when you can come and go. Alcohol consumption, drug use, violence, theft, a lot of arguments going on, it's noisy. So a person who decides to stay outside, even if they have to deal with the coldest temperatures of winter or the heat of summer, they want their autonomy. They decide this is the only way to take control of their lives. Every four years, the city conducts what's known as a point in time survey to collect data. The last study was done in 2021 and it revealed that most of Toronto's homeless are men, mostly racialized and a large number are refugees. Okay. So I've shared some information with you about poverty and homelessness. I'd like to find out how does this measure up with your perspectives, your impressions of what a person is who is experiencing homelessness. So we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise. On the next slide, there will be a QR code that I invite you to click on and we'll see what are the word or words that you insert that show us what your impressions are when you hear the word homeless. So let's get started. Click on that QR code. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, sorry. Hello. So the numbers that are starting to show up in the word cloud are shared by many of you. So we're seeing hunger, alcoholism, laziness, dirty, unsupported. The largest words are the ones that are common to most of you. Unsanitary. What we're seeing is a, a very dismal picture that's being painted here. And these are your impressions. And mental health are the ones that come up most consistently. 
Thank you. Makes me feel very sad looking at these words. Struggling, alone, unsupported, cold. We know that to be true. We're starting to enter those cold months. Food insecurity. Yep. So in these next set of slides, we are going to look at a series of statements that reflect some of the most frequently asked questions and statements that come up in our work. So we want to share slide by slide each of these statements, and the answer is either true or false. So like we did just before, the next slide will be where you enter your answer, click on the QR code, and then we will see what it reveals. So it's a choice to be homeless, true or false. A little bit of hesitation there. Okay, so what we're seeing for the most part is the majority of you believe this statement to be false. It's very few people choose to be homeless. More often than not, homelessness is a result of losing a job or not being able to maintain one, a lack of affordable housing, escaping from domestic violence. Do you know that there is a seven to 10 year waiting list to find affordable housing? Some people are struggling with men mental health issues. So when you don't have a safety net and you are you lose your housing, you have no choice. It is not a choice, and I see that most of you agree with that. Next slide. People experiencing homelessness are lazy. Is that true or false? It didn't take you long to answer that one. In our experience, people who are homeless are spending most of their time surviving. They're seeking shelter. They're pacing the sidewalk day after day, collecting food where they can find it, cashing their social assistance check in order to buy food. They're spending their days searching for their most basic needs. So just consider that. The next time you see somebody ask, asking for loose change or sleeping on a grate, that's just a moment in their day. You're just seeing a sliver of their life. So to, to understand further, that's what we're doing here today. We're learning about the conditions of homelessness. And by the way, if, you're, if you are food insecure and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you really don't have the energy. So that's why you're seeing people sleeping. They're trying to revamp their energy to get up again and look for their most basic needs. Most people experiencing homelessness are addicts. True or false? False. That is true. Oh, we have we have competing. Very close call here. I think we've settled on 67% of you believe that most people experiencing homelessness are addicts, that it is false. It's a false statement. Much of the research shows that around one third of people who are homeless have problems with alcohol and or drug use. And around two thirds of that number have lifetime histories of drug 
or alcohol use. So that even is a factor before homelessness ever showed up in their lives. And it more or less matches the general population. There are many risk factors for why people are to becoming addicts. They are self-medicating. They're coping with a really miserable situation. So it's an escape. They have a lack of social support. They're living in isolation. They're lonely. They might be experiencing trauma. And so to forget or to dull the pain, they look to alcohol and substance use. They may have physical health conditions and untreated mental illness. And so there's no immediate solution. And so they resort to substances, alcohol, and might eventually succumb to addiction. Our next slide is people living on the street should just find a job. True or false? This time I realized I have to wait for all the uh, answers to come in. So it's clear that a majority of you feel that this statement is false, but there's still a certain number that believe that that is the solution. A person living on the street should just find a job. So I want you to consider what's, re what's required to find a job. Think about it in your own life for a moment, that you have to Consider all of your life experiences, your skills, the jobs you had before, writing a resume, sending it off, searching online, searching on LinkedIn or other sources. Now think about the person who does not have shelter, living in a shelter or on the street. They don't have a permanent address. They don't have regular access to showers or clean clothes. You need clean clothes every day if you're gonna show up to a job or the interviews. What about transportation barriers? How are you gonna to get to that interview or that job and get there on time? What about untreated physical and mental illness? And one of the most important aspects of seeking employment is a certain level of self-esteem. You have to feel good about yourself. And when you are in a situation of homelessness, you are not feeling good about yourself. Next slide, our next statement is, there are plenty of services out there. True or false? Bruce, can, can we see the um, QR code? Oh, there we go. Okay, so the answers seem to be holding here. One of our staff, uh, just going back to that last slide for a second, said it's worth noting that there are people who are experiencing homelessness and who are working at the same time. Thank you for that, Marnie. On this slide, uh, we're talking about whether there are plenty of services out there. Uh, what was the um, the tally? Okay, almost 60% of you felt that that is a true statement. As we've seen, it's actually not the case. There is a shortage of space, first of all, in the shelters, there's a waiting list. There's a shortage of access to food, meals, and other resources. There's a shortage of staffing 
in all of these agencies and shelters. And we know that the demand is growing for services and caseloads are overflowing. So where the government is funding resources, it does play a role in the solution, they're not enough. And that's where charities like that have to come in, they step in and they fill the gap. Homelessness can reduce someone's life expectancy. Is that true or false? Oh, we, um, we have unanimous response here. 100% of you believe that to be true. According to a recent study, homelessness can reduce a person's life expectancy by as much as 40%. And that is due to poor living conditions, limited access to healthcare, greater risk of infection, a person's immune system is compromised, so they become far more vulnerable to the illnesses that are circulating. A person will develop chronic illness and therefore earlier death. And imagine we're entering fall winter, those frigid temperatures are a time when you will hear the reports of death on the streets. This brings us to a wonderful, wonderful graduate of our Via Hafta Skills Academy. Her name is LaMarche. She dispels a lot of the myths surrounding homelessness that we've encountered in the last series of slides. I would really like for you to hear her story. In 2021, I was homeless and I was in a shelter with my three kids. And then they had like a bad, um, infestation with the cockroaches. I'm telling you, I've never experienced that in my life. The cockroaches were everywhere. They were in our food. It was bad. It was horrible. Mentally, I don't even know how I survived. But from the VSA program, I, I gained so much confidence from learning about myself. Before I knew it, nine weeks passed and I have become this empowered woman. <laughs> I know, felt like I could conquer the world. So after that, all the amazing things happened after that. Um, I said I wanted to buy a car, I bought a car. I said I wanted to get a house, I got a house. I moved from the shelter into a home with the kids. So those were the little things that we needed to get done. And I, I graduated, I graduated from Humber. <laughs> I did. <laughs> that was my, my proudest moment as yet in life. And then having my son, who also struggles with um, behavioral problems, I am now more capable of helping him. The resources, I am able to find him places that he can get all the help that he needs. And I, you know, I guide him along the way. So yeah, I've, I'm now able to support him so much better. His grades have improved. He was getting D's and E's. No, he's, his last report, he got A's and B's. Ah, yeah, I would have, if anybody told me when I just started that three and a half years, this would be me sitting here, I'd say, no way, mm -mm, no way. I, confidence was self-esteem. And I think from the moment I saw that I completed nine weeks, everything went pff. If that beginning, I don't, if I did not have the right environment, the right people and the support, knowing that there's just one person who believe in me, just one. I could not let her down. Because, you know, the way how she said, Lamarche, you know you can do it. I keep hearing her voice. I'm like, I have to. Thanks to Vieta for changing my life. You guys gave me the tools to make me realize that I had it in me all along. I have to tell you, I just love her energy, her positivity. I love that woman. As you can see from LaMarche, the truth we know at Vahavta is that individuals facing homelessness can transcend their situation. And in order to make that huge leap, they need access to resources and professional help. And maybe 
the most important part of all of it is the support and accountability of people who care. What we learn from LaMarche is universal. We know that people facing homelessness need help to prevail over poverty. They need intervention. We have a special recipe. We call it Vahafta's special sauce. We believe in the limitless potential of every individual, and we know that each soul has their journey on this planet and their unique contribution to make in this world. They may have lost it along the way, but we help them to recover what was already there. And that is what underpins our values. We treat people with the utmost respect and dignity. This philosophy is summed up quite beautifully in the name of this organization, Vehafta. It's a Hebrew word that means, and you shall love. And it comes from a longer phrase in the Torah, which is repeated 36 times. Vehafta larecha kamocha. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the value that drives us to do what we do every day. So we meet people where they're at, and we also provide them with what they need to survive and take the next step in their journey. So depending on the individual, this could mean anything from emergency relief supports, learning opportunities in our programs, referrals through our case managers, internships, programs, paid internship programs, and overall a sense of community that is integrated into all of this. And this is where you come in. Peers play a critical role at Vehafta. Vehafta is one of the only organizations that offers direct, hands-on, meaningful volunteer opportunities with the people that we serve. Our volunteers bridge a gap between two worlds. Their care, empathy, kindness, acceptance are the qualities that create an atmosphere of normalization and humanity. Now, many of you might not think that doing one shift on the van or facilitating a workshop or bringing in sandwiches or helping out in the warehouse can make a difference in a person's life that there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect. Acts of volunteerism and kindness have a disproportionate impact because among other things, they're done in the context of an accepting, loving and supportive community. So there is a cumulative effect. You are part of a community of people giving and giving your empathy, your time. In addition to professional supports, People are facing poverty and know that society hasn't abandoned them. That's um, a very important point that I can't overemphasize. So by seeing them, by caring, by showing up, you can give others strength and dignity and courage. You help them to build resilience. What is more powerful than that? So your one small act can help and poverty. So I want to share a little video that we put together that we hope sends home the message, that sends home the point that small acts make a big difference. So as we near the end of this presentation, 
I want to talk to you about the ways that you can help right now. You can sign up to become a volunteer. You can register in our portal, look at the opportunities and sign up for a shift. So there's tons of ways to get involved, all ages, all schedules. In the next slide, there will be a QR code that you can click on to enter that volunteer portal. But also after this presentation, we're gonna send out a thank you letter, a thank you email, and in there will be a link to the volunteer sign up. You can share this recording. And if you found it interesting, please share the recording with your people, spread the word and help break down the stigma. The link will be in that email. How about taking a selfie tonight at the CN Tower? The CN Tower, is gonna be lit up in Verhofte colors of green, blue, and yellow. And then tag Verhofte News, share it on social to raise awareness. If um, you aren't gonna be at the CN Tower, you can check out the live stream. We'll pr provide the link in the email as well. And finally, we would love for you to donate uh, we appreciate your generosity and your donation helps towards running our programs for developing them further and creating new ones. So I'm thanking you in advance. Here's the QR code if you want to enter the volunteer portal immediately. And if you have any difficulties or questions about it, you can reach out to me, Ruth Hart or my colleague, Natalie Ayers. We're here to help you and answer your questions. And so this brings us to the end of the formal presentation. And now we're gonna to move to question and answer period. And our very knowledgeable experts on staff will answer the questions that you entered in the chat. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we have several questions in the chat, um, and I, I open the floor to to any of our frontline staff to to answer these. Um, what is the best thing? Nancy asks, what is the best thing we can do when we see someone homeless on the street? For example, on the Danforth, what what's the best thing that we can do? Is Natalie here? Can you hear me, the tech and unmuting. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, hi. I'm trying to get the owls to look at me. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Natalie, our manager of street outreach. Hi, everyone. And Shelly, who um, was an outreach worker on then and currently is in a case manager position as well. So they both have, I've got to get like the way here. Um, so they can both speak to um, a bit about uh, what you can do when you encounter someone in the community. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Go ahead. I was going to say, my first thought is like one of the most important things that we can do is just acknowledge somebody and treat them with respect and dignity like they were just one of us by saying hello smiling anything like that that was the first thing that came to mind for me yeah absolutely um we often get a lot of feedback from our clients you know aside from everything that we provide the meals and the supplies we often hear you know thank you so much for asking me how my day was or thanks for chatting with me it means so much um, aside from that, if you see somebody and you would like to give them something and, and support them, I often encourage folks to either have some gift cards with them in their car or create a little basket for yourself that you keep in the car with some non-perishable items like granola bars, water bottles, um, also depending on the weather, if you can, in the winter time when it's very cold, there's little um, like hand heat pads or, you know, things like that. Um, also, for those that do come out and volunteer with us, we're more than happy to hand out our business cards uh, with the direct phone number for the van phone number. Um, and folks can, can give us a call if they need any other supports at, at any time. Excellent. Um, uh, Jenny, I'm just going to, there was a follow-up related question uh, that just popped in I saw. Can you speak to the communities you see within encampments, parks, etc.? Is there a support system for them? Can you speak to the communities? Is that the question, sir? Like, can you talk about with regards to oh. the communities and encampments? 
Is that any different? How would you do that? I wouldn't say it's any different. I mean, we support them. A lot of the communities we go to with the van, um, and it's sort of the same idea. We we you know we give out our card and our information, and we encourage we encourage um, them to also like a lot of it is word of mouth. So we encourage a lot of people to like spread the you know spread the word and you know come and use our resources or reach out to us because they can you know get a hold of us directly. And if we can facilitate it, it will come in and meet people as yeah. we can. And just also going a little bit further, we do work with other organizations. So, you know, it's it's never a good idea to work in silos, um, especially when we're tackling such big issues. Um, so it's really nice to get more people involved and listen to what the needs are and really try to address those needs as best as we can. And also not to mention um, encampments, and you know the, the homeless population a lot of them do have formed their own little communities uh, not always but a lot of them do really look out for one another and and try to you know we're all humans and we try to support each other as best as we can we have another question um a related another follow-up question as the opioid crisis escalates and safe injection sites are closed what can we do when we see people who are in clear distress that's Natalie's question. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would encourage every person ever to go through a naloxone training. Um, it's free through the City of Toronto website and also to carry naloxone with you. Um, the reality is, is that we are in a crisis and if you are out you know, walking to work or just downtown, whatever it is, um, you may encounter somebody that is, you know, minutes away and really needs some help. So being able to know how to jump in and support is is crucial to saving lives, really. N Natalie, uh, can you just explain a little further what uh, naloxone is? Yeah, I'm actually going to pass that on to Shelley. Um, so it is it so it, it's used to um, counter the effects of opioids it only it does only work with um opioids and there's two ways that you can um, administer it it is through uh, nasal or injectable and it basically will you know reverse the effect of the overdose you still have to call 911 you should still get them help because depending on how much of the drug they have in their system once the naloxone effects reduce, then if they can sort of go back into an overdose state because of the level of drugs in their system. So it's always important to call 911. They will guide you through using naloxone um, and it can't hurt anybody either. So let's say you come across somebody and you do administer the naloxone, but they're not using an opioid, you can't harm them. It just won't work. It won't, re it won't reverse the overdose effect. We, we will include a link in our follow-up email to everyone with uh, a, with a link to that that free training resource. Jenny, um, I would like to just step in there too. Um, sure. I'm a kind of manager here at Vea Hofta. Another thing to keep in mind when you're seeing clients in distress, sometimes it can be overwhelming to interact with them too, right? Uh, a good thing that you can do is when you call 911, you can always call for an MCIT team. With an MCIT team, it can have a social worker or a nurse go out, and that can be a lot better to kind of support these clients and stuff like that. So when we call 911, you can say, can we get an MCIT team? And they'll come out and kind of help diffuse any situation that's happening with the client, as well as calling Gerstein Crisis. They have an outreach van that can go out and support people in distress. So that's another two options to look into. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question we have here, Nancy's second question, um, what can we do to motivate system changes? Uh, for example, more investment in housing. What actions do you recommend to us as citizens to encourage change by government? Who wants to field that one? <laughs> Sorry, Jenny, can you repeat that? Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm one of the case managers for our pre-employment skill training program. Yeah, the question is, is um, what can individual citizens do to motivate system changes? Mm. Uh, like what actions do you recommend us to do for to, for government in terms of government, in terms of influencing government? 
Yeah, I think it's really critical that when we think of changes, we do think on a system level, a macro level, that's like a very common term is this macro level, government-wide systemic changes. The individual changes we do when we go out and we meet with people and we work one-on-one -on -one are fantastic and necessary for encouraging people when we think of perseverance or resiliency. For systemic changes, this does require a lot of mobilizing. It could include protesting. It could be going to members of parliament or members of provincial parliament. So we think of like housing or we think of like rent and ensuring that we have a sufficient supply and adequate amount of like rent geared to income housing units for people. That's a provincial level thing. We know that like rent is a is provincially controlled throughout Canada, right? So it would be advocating to members of government. It could be something as learning who are the the you know elected officials in your neighborhood in your community going to them a lot of them have um offices local offices you can reach out via email show up at the office and share with them some of the concerns that you might have to best support all of our community members our unhoused community members it could even be like community members who are maybe elderly and living alone maybe you know a neighbor who might be at risk of eviction we know that rental costs are skyrocketing and simply put what people make on social assistance social assistance also including retirement cpp oas those are also social assistance programs um is simply not enough to to um st keep up with the cost of living so it could be advocating finding groups that are already doing this advocacy work and joining, volunteering, um, seeing what community organizations and services are doing some of these advocacy works. Uh, there are some groups that are, that are advocating for higher social assistance rates for Ontario Works or the Ontario Disability Support Program and supporting them in, in their efforts and um, um events that they have and seeing ways that they might also recommend on a systemic level, how can we bring about change? <clears throat> I'll jump in and add that being aware of policies that are being proposed and being supported by specific politicians also helps to guide how things go in terms of who you are supporting, who you are voting for, what policies you're supporting as a, a, a member of a democratic society, you're voting in the politicians who are putting these policies forward. So you have the ability to influence how things go by being attuned to uh, when different policies and different uh, ideas are coming forward at the governmental level and by politicians, being aware of what they are if you support them to remember who the who the person the politician is that's bringing it forward and then supporting them with your votes and with your um uh supportive letters and uh petitions and all kinds of ways that you can demonstrate that you as a citizen of this city care about this issue and it matters to you very good um i just want to note mia just uh posted a link, any individual can access nasal spray or injectable um, naloxone at no cost through uh, participating pharmacies. So we will add that link as well to the follow-up email. Um, we have some additional questions here about the van route. Where does the van leave from? Um, and, and where does it, what areas does it service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the van does leave from our offices, which is in North York, um, and so we have two vans. One van goes to North York and the Scarborough area, and then the other van is in the downtown core. Excellent. Um, okay, is that it for questions? Have I? Uh, please speak up if I've. Uh, I will. We'll give you um, the ability to unmute. Jenny, I also saw someone, um, Nancy, in, in one of her points, um, talk about her experience volunteering on the van. Oh, how, yes. can we, how can we make this experience an experience that more people have? Um, tell people. <laughs> tell, tell everyone people. that you know. Um, sign up as volunteers. Come out on the van. Um, 
we, we have kids from as young as 12 with guardians on the van that come out as well. I think it's a great youth opportunity. It's so weird to be talking to the screen there. Um, <laughs> it's a fantastic opportunity for people of all ages. So please just spread the word and they can sign up. And we have some volunteers who come regularly all the time on the van. And we have some who come as one-offs for um, sort of the eye-opening experience that it is. So spread the word. Uh, we have one last question. Other than the name and philosophy, is there anything particularly Jewish about the work that we do? Um, Carrie? <laughs> so is there something particularly Jewish? So based in the values of Judaism that we've already talked about that we see as universal values across a lot of different faith traditions and even non-faith traditions about the value of every individual person. Um, but in addition to those philosophies, they have to exist as a way to action Judaic values, the values that we see in the Torah, which is the Bible, in prayer, in philosophy, Jewish philosophy. They have to provide a way for ordinary people to um, do Judaism. So to perform the mitzvot, which are the commandments and the good deeds, which is how it's commonly um, translated, uh, that we are commanded to do as a part of uh, of the, the, the Bible that we adhere to. So ve'ahavta is a way of, you know, in your busy life, it's, you know, a lot of people, we really believe that people want to do good and want to help other people, but it's not so easy to know how you can help. And I love that you've all come out to attend this because it really shows that you want to learn and you want to find a way to help other people. And they have to exist as a way for you to not have to invent the wheel and not create a van and not cook food and collect items, but just by simply showing up, you can do a volunteer shift in our kitchen and help make food for people who will receive it tonight. You can volunteer in a host of different ways to really perform uh, some of the good deeds that help you bring these beautiful values and concepts of Judaism to life and into action. Beautiful. Uh, we just have a follow-up question. Anything specific pertaining to the various Yom Tovim, our, our specific holidays? Uh, not totally not really. sure what the question means. Um, you know, for those of you who have been involved with Be'ahavta, you know that although we are a Jewish organization, we serve people of all faiths and backgrounds on purpose and by design. And while um, it is for the purpose of really fulfilling our values as members of the Jewish community and also the broader community, um, there isn't anything specific that we do around observances. So we don't we don't pray when you're out on the outreach fan and we don't, you know, those kinds of religious observances aren't really a part of what we do at Be'ahavta. And our focus is really on actioning the values. So as we celebrate during this time of the high holidays and the many holidays that are, are happening in the coming days, um, it is a time at always as we're contemplating, how can I be a better person? How can I live my values? How can I operate my life with integrity, with authenticity is really just, this is another way to think about if you're searching for a way to find and have greater meaning in your life, if you're searching for a way to action your values as a Jewish person or as a person in humanity, this is a way for you to consider doing that. And, you know, the holidays are a beautiful time as we're reflecting and contemplating to also reflect and contemplate the people around us who need our help, people around us who are suffering, people around us who really need the support that we uniquely can offer. And every single person here, every one of us has the ability to make a difference, real difference, even if it's making a sandwich. And you could fairly say, well, what difference does it make if I make a sandwich? So what? That's not gonna feed someone the next day or the day after that. But if you ask the person who will receive that sandwich tonight off of our outreach bin, and many of our outreach workers are here today and they can speak to it, 
they will tell you that it makes all the difference in the world. And one of the ways that it makes all the difference in the world is the actual food and the sandwich. But the other part is that you're demonstrating that you care about them. And that matters, you know, it matters. So if you can think of yourself when you're having a bad day or things aren't going well in, in your world, somebody just saying like, hey, I care about you. Like, I'm sorry you're going through this. Like, how can I help? Makes a big difference, a really big difference. So I hope that during these holidays and while we're thinking about how we can be better people and how we can help the people around us, that we'll also think about ways that we can action these intentions so that they're not just nice ideas and they aren't just nice words that we say in synagogue or around our holiday tables, but they're actually things that we do, that we take action and say, I can make a difference in this small way and I'm going to do it. Wonderful. Does anyone have any other questions? Thank you for that, Carrie. Beautiful. Oh, um, I have I, not a question, something to add, just because it came up way earlier in Ruth's presentation, and I forgot to put it in the chat. Um, Ruth, I got to talk this way. Um, Ruth <laughs> talked about um, the point in time count. The last one was done in 2021, I believe. Um, it's actually, it's called the street needs assessment um, that the city of Toronto does to sort of um, get a sense of the status of the issue of homelessness in Toronto. They are about to do their next one. So it's taking place at the end of October and we'll have new updated information. They should be releasing it, I think, Q2 of 2025. So um, we'll probably share some um, insights that come out of that as well when the city of Toronto releases that data. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming and joining. Uh, we're so glad that you could, could learn with us today. And uh, we look forward to offering more opportunities like this. Thanks, everybody.